Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Lord's Day. Today we continue our study in the Gospel of Luke. Today, chapter 22, the Lord's Supper. But first, let's pray together. Lord, bring glory to your name through today's message. We honor you and we praise you and thank you for what you went through so that we could have life. Help us understand the truth of this message today, Lord. I ask for a special word for each person. Now, Lord, I lift up the prayer requests that are on people's hearts. Lord, I lift up those who are sick and those who are in the hospital and those who are recovering, Lord, and those who had surgery or are having surgery, that you'd be with them in their recovery. I just ask for your grace and your mercy, Lord. And those having tests and procedures, Lord, and going through very difficult times, I lift them up to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I lift up those who have loved ones that have passed. And Lord, they just need to feel the love of God. I just lift them up to you that they will feel your love and you will comfort them. And Lord, I also ask, you said you came to seek and save that which was lost, and I ask you to do that. <laughs> I ask you to speak to people who don't know you that they may come to know you as Savior and have eternal life. Thank you for your word. We honor you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Luke chapter 22, the Passion Week. Now, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priest and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. A couple of things going on here. First, it mentions the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were drawing near. It was time for him to have his Lord's Supper, which was a celebration of Passover and a fulfillment of Passover. But it also mentions unleavened bread. Well, these two feasts run together, and you have the Passover which is celebrated in the Hebrew month Nisan on the 14th day. And then the unleavened bread starts immediately thereafter from the 15th through the 21st of Nisan. And that's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But you can't, the two go together, you can't separate them. Because the Feast of Passover, as we well know, is a celebration of the deliverance by the blood of the Lamb. And how they had to take a lamb and they had to, select the lamb and how they had to very carefully had to be a lamb without spot and blemish. Then they had to, to kill the lamb and then they had to shed its blood and then they had to apply the blood. And they were delivered when the death angel passed because they, they had applied the blood and when he saw the blood, he passed over them. And that's what this whole message of the Lord's Supper is about. Deliverance by the blood of the lamb. And then after that, they celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, leaven in, in the Bible, he uses it as a picture of sin to explain what sin is like. Uh, leaven itself is like yeast that causes the bread to rise and, and is an agent you inject into the bread to be able to allow it to rise. And leaven in itself is not bad, but, but it, he uses that as a picture to explain sin. Because just like it causes the bread to rise, something like sin, a little bit of sin can affect the whole loaf or affect the whole body. And it says the wages of sin is death, but it also causes it to be puffed up or pride to inject. But we're told to, to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy and beware of unbelief and beware of pride and beware of worldliness and compromise. These things can, and particularly sin, they can cause the whole body to be infected. And so he uses leaven as a picture to explain sin. Well, Feast of Unleavened Bread was to remove all the sin out of your life, to remove the former life. You're a new creature in Christ. Now that you're saved, you're a new creature from this point on. And they were to be very careful to get all the leaven out because it makes a difference how you live as a believer. And we need to be pure before God. And we need to, to have our sins forgiven and to move forward and to live so others can come to know him. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's about living a separated life, a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. Those old things need to pass away. But then it, the secondly, he mentions 
that the chief priests were looking for opportunity to have him put to death. <clears throat> so you have conflicting issues. You have the Lord wanting to celebrate Passover, wonderful event and, and powerful event of his death and resurrection. And on the other hand, you had the enemy working to destroy that which God has created to set us free. And so it says, Then Satan entered Judas, named Iscariot, who was numbered with the twelve. So he went his way and confirmed with the chief priests and captains that he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them to the absence in the absence of the multitude. So what the chief priests were looking for was an opportunity under cover of night when no one else is around and uh, to do it secretly to arrest Jesus because he had a lot of popularity. He, many people came to the Passover just to see Jesus. So they couldn't do it in front of the crowd. So they had to do it under, the, under cover. That's why they had the trial of Jesus at night, which they weren't supposed to do, but that's why they did it. So they were looking for that opportunity and Judas provided it. He was one of the 12. Judas was one of the closest friends of Jesus. Jesus loved Judas. But yet it said Satan entered him and he went and conspired. What does that mean? It means that he was deceived. He was, he was influenced by the enemy and, and, and his thought patterns and things like that. But before we feel sorry for Judas, he didn't have to fulfill the prophecy. What happened was there was a prophecy given in Zechariah that he would betray him for 30 pieces of silver. But the prophecy was there because it saw what would happen in advance. It saw Judas's action and then it wrote it down in advance. So Judas just, God saw what Judas would choose. But even with all of that, it says that Judas was an unbeliever from the beginning that his problem was unbelief. He never accepted who Jesus really was and understood giving his life to Jesus and what that meant. It also said he was a carrier of the money bag. He was the treasurer, which may have attracted him to the 30 pieces of silver. But it said he was a thief. In fact, when he said uh, this money could have been given to the poor, when Mary spent a lot of money to get this precious ointment to anoint Jesus for his burial, but yet Judas said, this could have been, what a waste of money. This could have been used for the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and, and he had the money bag. And so we're told a little about his character already. But also you think, well, why did Jesus pick him as a disciple if he knew he'd betray him? And yes, he knew in advance that he would. But I think that's why he struggled in prayer all night to pick the disciples and picking Judas as well. But, you know, God reaches out to the unbeliever as well as a believer. Those who are against him as well as those who are for him because God wants all to be saved. He even called Judas his friend. He loved Judas. And he got to see all the miracles and everything all the other disciples did. But not everybody accepts the Lord, regardless of the proof they have. And so when we look at that, it gives you a different picture of what's going on. So all of a sudden, he agreed to betray Jesus. Now the upper room is prepared. <clears throat> it says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. In other words, this is the death of the Passover lamb, which was Jesus. He was the lamb of God. Uh, and he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said, Behold, when you have entered a city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house he enters. Then he will say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room and there make ready. So first off, we see this man carrying a pitcher and Jesus gives specific instructions where the room will be. But there's more to this than beats the eye because it mentions that then he showed them a large furnished upper room and he said there make ready. Well Passover is a celebration that almost all Jews want to be there for it. It's the big event. 
it's four times its normal size and getting a big room to have a big group having dinner together is not that easy to find in Jerusalem. But yet God made these reservations a long time ago. That's why it was already furnished and prepared. And they found it just ready for them already because God had prepared this event long ago. He prepared to send his son into the world to die for the world so that we could have hope. It was his opportunity to be able to show the world this powerful lesson of Passover and how Jesus fulfilled that. So this had been planned a long time ago and God had already set the table. It's already been prepared for us. So then it says, so they went and found it just as he said to them and they made ready the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles with him. And he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say this to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is kind of contrary to the way we normally think. You know, knowing what Jesus would go through, and he knew exactly what he was going to go through, the pain, the suffering, the, the spiritual, emotional, mental, and the physical torture that he would go through. Why is he so looking forward to it? Well, he's looking forward to it because of the joy set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, because it was for our benefit. He saw what it would do for us, that it would set us free. It was the one event, the most important event ever in history of mankind, where Jesus would, this picture of Jesus dying for us and rising again, it's so important to the Christian faith, but he saw it as such a, this would set people free. It, he would have to pay for our sins, but yet it would set us free. So he's excited about sharing this event because it's, it's what's going to save mankind. And so that's so powerful. Then he goes on, he said to them, where do you want us? Then it says, then he, with fervent desire, desired for I will no longer eat it. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this, divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I come to my Father's kingdom. So here he's drinking a cup, and this is the first of four cups that are drank during the Lord's Supper or the Passover at that time. But the Passover is so important that they had four significant cups. The first one was probably the one he drank here, which is a cup of blessing over the meal and uh, God's blessings as, as we do that. And, and you know, he, he, he says that, you know, he will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until he comes into his father's kingdom. And, and so what he's saying is he's saying, this is our last meal together. That's why they were so sad and burdened and their hearts were troubled because they didn't want Jesus to leave. But this is the last time they would share together. But the next time will be in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb. <laughs> and you want an invitation to that one. And he's already granted it by dying on the cross for you. And you just have to accept it and apply the blood. But yet we all can celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. The last event <laughs> was a meal together. And the first event in heaven is a meal together. What a beautiful picture of, of salvation. But these four cups, let me mention them briefly. You had the cup of blessing, then they had the cup of judgment where they would kind of go over the, the deliverance they had in Egypt and they would eat bitter herbs that represented the bitterness of sin and bondage and what life was like. It was bitter, it was hard, it was difficult. And then the kerosene, which was like a mixture that was to remind them of the mortar from the from the bricks, or the bricks that Pharaoh made them have to make themselves. And so this, this represented hard labor and, and, and slavery and, and, and just being beaten and, and the things of life were hard. And so he's talking about that when he, when he says that. Uh, but yet that cup of judgment leads to the third one, which was the one that set us free, the cup of redemption. And the third cup is the cup of redemption that we are very familiar with that he passed for the blood of the new covenant that takes away the sins of the world. But 
The fourth one was a cup of praise or an end of the, the meal together. But uh, it's interesting because Jesus had to drink the cup of judgment to offer us the cup of redemption, which is the next cup. Somebody had to pay for judgment, and he took that judgment so he could offer us the cup of redemption. And also, he had to drink that cup from the garden. Let this cup pass for me, this, this cup of the wrath of God upon sin and judgment and become sin for us so we could be set free. Praise the Lord that he took our judgment so we could have the cup of redemption. Going on, he institutes the Lord's Supper. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Well, I want to mention this part about remembrance. It says, Do this in remembrance of me. And you'll see that on a lot of, a, a lot of the tables that we share the Lord's Supper on or communion at different churches. It says, Do this in remembrance of me. Well, why did he say that? Because it is important. In fact, the Bible even says in 1 Corinthians, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You're giving the reason that he died. And, and we remember that every year. And, and every time we gather for communion, it's a remembrance of what Jesus had done for us. And, and we do need to remember that. We need to keep it fresh in our mind that it cost Jesus' life. But it's also a sign to the world. And it's a reminder to them of, of what we celebrate, the death of Jesus and his resurrection, because it, 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 it is our deliverance. So it's important to remember. But just like the prodigal son, when he, when he remembered how good it was in his father's house, he went back and he was redeemed. And they killed the fatted calf. <laughs> and put on the robe of righteousness and the ring on his finger because he had changed, his heart had changed. But to remember God, that's important. And it's a reminder of what he did. So we do need to do it in remembrance of him. But then we get into the bread and the cup. <clears throat> the bread, it says, he took the bread, gave thanks, gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. So the first thing he did was he tore the bread. And his body, although not a bone of his body was broken, but he took a beating for us. He gave his life and he was flogged for us. And so he's saying, this is my body, which is given for you. He surrendered himself. He gave his life for us. And when you look at the importance of the bread, Jesus is called the bread of life, the one we need to sustain life. And yet, when you look at it, the Bible says, greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And it also said, he is the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his friends. Jesus offered him his life. He offered them, he says, I will die for you. And he passed it to them. He offered to give his life for us. And so that we could live. And if we understood the meaning of this, Lord's Supper would mean so much more to us and it needs to. But this is what you call the greatest price. The greatest price is that you weren't redeemed with silver and gold. You can't buy salvation. You can't, you can't earn it. You, there's nothing you can do to achieve it or pay for it. And it's not on merit, but it's on the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb without spot and without blemish. That, that we are redeemed with a life and it cost him the greatest price, his life, so that we could be redeemed. The bread. He, was, he, he gave his life willfully, and he offered it to us. Then you get to the cup. And I also want to read the passage from Matthew, where it says, Then he took the cup, he gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins or the forgiveness of sins. So the blood is for the forgiveness of sin. It's a payment. It's an atonement. And so he said, drink from it, for this is the blood of the new covenant. It's a new way. God has made a way. He was the way, the truth, and the life. And this is the way. In fact, the Christian faith was called the way for a long time. 
But when you look at this, you know, this is what gives us a new way to salvation. The old covenant was about the law and how we failed God and how we need forgiveness and how year after year they would have to offer sacrifices to be able to, to ask forgiveness for, for the next year. And, and yet it, it was constant because it was a constant reminder. But at the same time, God made sin his only son. What the bull, blood of bulls and goats could not do, Christ did through his blood and his shedding. And once and for all, he tore the veil and he ripped it apart when he said it is finished and he presented his blood to the Father. And when he did that, the veil was open and the way is open to God. I mean, it's a new covenant. It is a new way. It's a way to be saved because we can't earn it on our own. God did open a way for us to have that, the blood of the new covenant. But there's more to this blood. There is power in the blood. You know, the Bible even says the life is in the blood. And, and actually, the Bible, science, and medical field all agree that this is true. <laughs> that the Bible, and, and there's a verse where it says in Leviticus 17.11, written in 1500 B.C. roughly, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for your souls upon the altar, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for your souls. You need blood to live. And, and when you see this, you think, well, what does blood do? It's a center of our heart. That's why we accept him in our heart. And the life-giving flow goes through your body and it provides nourishment and oxygen to all parts of the body. The whole body is, is alive because of the blood. <laughs> And, and then it brings back impurities and cleans it up. I mean, it's an incredible thing what God created. And, and when, you know, I, that's why it says the, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, because how did this just happen? It didn't. God created a, a way to give life to us. And it's through the blood, but the blood gives atonement. And if you think about the power in the blood, and you think about this life-giving blood that everybody does blood drives because people need blood to live and they can't lose too much blood, so they're given blood. And you think about the rare blood types and, you know, and, and how they'll pay money to get people with rare blood types because they need that blood. And because people who have those rare blood types, they don't have any hope if they don't get the right blood. Well, this is the rarest blood indeed, the blood of the lamb. And... You know, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But this blood is a, the rarest blood of all. Why? Because it said a lamb had to be selected. He's the only one. And they spent a lot of time making sure the lamb was without spot and without blemish, that it was an acceptable sacrifice. Well, God chose his only son because he's the only one without spot and without blemish. So it's the rarest one. He's the only one. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved in the name of Jesus. We, we need the blood of Jesus. It is the rarest blood type, and yet it's the only one, but we all need it to live. We need an infusion of God's blood to forgive us and give us life, but it's spiritual life. It's so important that we have this spiritual life inside because we're dead in trespasses and sins, but he makes us alive through the blood of Jesus. It's a life-giving force that will, will give us the life. But his blood is different. It's undefiled. It's incorruptible. There is power in the blood. And it, it, we are redeemed with the cost of precious blood that cost him his life. And, and as I mentioned earlier, this verse, knowing that you're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot and without blemish. He was the only one. And we need the blood of Jesus to be redeemed. It's the only blood God will accept as a payment for our sin. There is power in the blood. And you know, I love a couple of hymns. One is called The Power in the Blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's a wonderful power in the blood. <laughs> you know, and I love that one that says, Nothing but the blood of Jesus can, can wash away sins. We're washed in the blood of Jesus. I mean, it's the only one that can remove sins and remove the impurities in us to get the spiritual life in us that we need. 
But there is power in the blood because it's power to save. It's a power to forgive sin. It's for the remission of sin. It's the it's a power to deliver and it's a power to heal. By his stripes we are healed. He shed so much blood so that we could have life and he gave his life so we could be forgiven. He even sweat drops of blood because he was praying for our deliverance and the fervent desire he had for our to be set free. He paid a heavy price, but we get freedom from it. There is power in the blood. Verse 21, but behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man to whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves, which of them would do this thing? It, it's natural tendency for everyone to say, oh, gee, was it me? Was it me? Did I do something? What did I do? And so that also showed they didn't know it was Judas. But yet he mentioned one of you will betray me. And then they got into an argument over who's the greatest, which is the opposite of the, what the Lord was teaching them. Now there was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be your younger, and he who governs as the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. But you, you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the 12 thrones judging Israel. When you see this, you say, okay, they're arguing over who's the greatest. And Jesus says, the greatest among you is those who serve. And you know, he left the greatest example. It's, it's those who humble themselves under the mighty hand of God that will be exalted in due season. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled. I mean, this is such a picture. We have it opposite in this world. We, we look at it opposite, but God looks at, I mean, we honor the exalted, but he honors the humble. He said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. In heaven, it's opposite because he said, if you want to be great, and Jesus said, I am, came among you to serve, but he has the highest honor. He's above all. And yet he's saying, I chose to serve you. But let me show you how powerful his servant attitude is and it's in Philippians chapter 2 and it says let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the likeness of man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, Jesus is the greatest example of serving. He washed his disciples' feet, a job of the lowest servant. And yet he shows us how to serve. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, serve others, love other people, put others before yourself and to put God first. What a powerful example he gave us. That's why he's highly exalted because he humbled himself to die for the world. And then he predicts his betrayer as well as one who, who would deny. I mean, he predicts the one that will deny him as well as betrayer. And, he's, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, this is Simon Peter. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should, should not fail, that when you return to me, strengthen the brethren. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day before you will deny three times that you even know me. 
So Jesus predicted Peter's denial and all of them said they would die with him and they all deserted him during the time of being arrested and, and going to trial. But yet Peter was adamant and he even tried to defend him in the garden and he was told to put up his sword. Those who live by the sword die by the sword and, and God could call down 12 legions of angels if he was here to fight, but he isn't. He was here to surrender. <laughs> and But he tells Simon, and this is important, says, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. And and that's like a sifter is like something that grounds it to fine powder. He's saying, Satan wants to destroy you through this. But I have prayed for you that you will, you will not be able to get up is what Satan wants. But then God says, but I've prayed for you that you'll get through this trial and this temptation and you will get up from it and you'll be an overcomer, and you will be able to help other people that go through similar, similar trials, and, and you will be a stronger person. But I have prayed for you, Peter. That's incredible. The power of prayer and how Peter didn't do much wrong after that. But it's incredible how even when we fall, God will pray for us. It's not those who who win the race, it's, it's, it's those who finish the race. Get back in the race. Don't give up. Get back in. If we fall, get back in. It's not too late to serve God. I hope this lesson blessed you. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Dear Lord, thank you for deliverance by the blood. <laughs> thank you, Lord, that we were bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. And thank you for giving your life for us like the bread, Lord. <laughs> We honor you and praise you. Be with the prayer request on people's hearts. And I ask if somebody doesn't know you, they will come to know you and deliverance by the blood. In Jesus' name, amen.